Hi everybody, thank you very much for coming here today. So I'm basically going to show you a small project I've been working on uh, when I reached Japan about a year and a half ago, which is uh, me buying a car and like playing around with it from a computer standpoint. So first of all, who am I? So my name is Stanislas Loger. I'm a French computer security engineer and I love cars and I love to fiddle with things. Uh, so when I was back in France, I would take my mom's car, my car, and just like play around, try to see what I can do with them, plug myself to the OBD2 port, get the data, reverse engineer, like all this kind of stuff. And a few of those projects actually led me to getting a job in Japan at White Motion, which is an automotive cybersecurity company where I work as an automotive vulnerability researcher. Um, when my company learned about this talk, the legal team barged in the room, so I'm going to say it now. All this work has been done in order to learn about ECUs and like practice a bit reverse engineering and uh, be able to use the full power of my car on racetrack and closed road only. So while this can be applied to any car from this era and is actually a common practice among car enthusiasts, I was asked to remove the car's precise information from this presentation. So from now on, I will be referring to my car as the 1997 manufacturer model. So uh, this is basically a 300 horsepower car from factories. The only thing I change are suspension, and it's very light. So it's extremely fast and very, very fun to drive, which uh, gave it its little nickname, Little Beast. Uh, I bought it about a year and a half ago, and I drove 55,000 kilometers with it, and it still rips. So it's very, a very, very enjoyable car. Before coming to Japan, I was actually working on, on one of my projects, which was building my custom infotainment system. So it's just a seven inches touchscreen connected to a Tinkerboard, and it queries data most of the time through OBD, prints them on the screen, and does like data logging, for example, alarms if the uh, coolant temperature gets too hot, a lot of um, like music option, of course, and uh, GPS tracking, so it knows, it, like I can recreate tracks and trips offline and see that in these corners I was going at that speed uh, on the first try, on the second try I was going faster and slower, all those kind of little options. So it's actually a very powerful tool as long as I can connect it to the car, but my car being 20-ish years old, uh, it didn't have OBD2, CAN and all those things, so I had to find a way to communicate with the ECU and this is basically how this whole project started. I wanted to connect my IVI to my new car. So, first of all, how do I communicate with my car? So this is uh, where it all started. This is the OBD2 looking port that is under the steering wheel. And uh, it has no CAN. So those two wires, 12 and 13, are actually constructor specific. So it means we are dealing with a constructor specific protocol. And that protocol from that manufacturer is actually called XSM. X is a placeholder here. So XSM is still used nowadays. Uh, it's like the fourth revision, XSM4 in newer vehicles, but mine should be XSM1 or 2. And what is nice is that a guy named Phil had a car from this manufacturer too, and he used to reverse engineer the protocol and he used back in the day. So he documented all of it on his website here, so I'm very thankful for that, because I like, uh, avoided wasting a lot of time. And uh, just to know, for example, which protocol I was dealing with, I just had to check whether the K-line was connected. The K-line here isn't connected, so I'm dealing with the first revision of XSM, which is XSM1. What is XSM1? So XSM1 is a very simple serial protocol running at about 2,000 bows on the 5-volt TTL circuit. So it's actually very, very easy to communicate with it. You have RX, TX, the ground, uh, a level converter, because the car is in 5-volt and the TNC is at 3.3. But it's about all you need to be able to communicate with your car, which is $15, so it's pretty nice. How do you actually use this protocol? So you don't have a lot of commands. You have like read, write, uh, get, ROM ID, and stop, because basically when you read a command, the ECU will flood you with the answer until you tell it to stop. So here, if I want to read an address, I will just launch this command, 78, most significant byte, least significant byte, zero, and get one byte as an answer. All the data I'm looking for, like RPM, speed, coolant temperature, are actually just bytes in memory, so everything in memory mapped. So I would um, query the RPM, for example, get a value on one byte, apply a small function on this value, because the RPM is not, like you can't hold the RPM on one byte, so you just, for example, multiply it by 25, and you get your RPM value. So all of it was actually extremely simple. But I was like, since I'm querying data, might as well dump the whole ECU. 
So this picture was taken in my company's facility, but same, they didn't want me to put any pictures, so I had to get a bit creative. Please look through the stars. So how do you dump the ECU? It's a 64 kilobyte uh, dump, so I just like do a for loop from 0 to X FFFF, which took about nine hours to dump, um, because I could only query five data per second, not because of the slow, not only because of the slow baud rate, but uh, because the actual routine that sends a byte back after a request is only uh, activated at a certain frequency and not after each request. So this was the main bottleneck. And I was like querying each byte twice just to be sure. It took about nine hours in, the, in my company's facility, so it was pretty fun to see the faces of people coming by and not understanding what I was doing. Right, so I get a 64 kilobyte dump like, of data. I don't know what it is. So I wanted to reverse engineer it, so I needed to find what kind of architecture we are working on. So I, I digged out the ECU, which is under three layers of carpet and a big metallic plate. I, I removed half of the dashboard before actually finding it there. Because anyway, and we get this ECU, which is about big like that, and is mint. This was my biggest surprise. It's a 20 years old board. There was no rust, no dust. It was extremely well conserved. Anyway, you find a few different interesting things. You have an immobilizer chip uh, slot here, main CPU and firmware, which is on uh, read-only memory. You have a lot of circuitry, transistors, a secondary chip, and a contact strip. This contact strip is interesting because since the whole firmware is in read-only memory, if the manufacturer wants to update the heat ECU, they would actually solder a daughter board on top of the motherboard, cut a certain transistor uh, resistance to say, OK, ECU, now you use this daughter board and not the initial code anymore. So after a lot of twittering and Googling, I found out that the IC is based on the Mitsubishi 7700 family. Uh, IDEA handles it, surprisingly. The main issue, like not issue, but um, problem when disassembling this kind of code is that you have an M flag that changes the instruction decoding at runtime. So one byte, if M is zero, will, for example, get an instruction of three bytes, while if M is one, you will get an instruction of four bytes. So if you get the M uh, value wrong, it will basically mess up your whole disassembly. So it was a bit uh, painful at first, but somehow we managed to do something out of it. Nice, we can load it in IDA now. How do we actually start reversing 64 kilobytes of code? I turned everything into code. I just basically turned everything into code and started looking for maps. So those engines actually use map for, like, to function. You will have a lot of ignition map, advanced map, fuel map that basically have the RPM as an axis, uh, engine load as another axis, and will decide how much ignition advance and timing you would put, how much fuel will mix with how much air. And all those maps are actually pretty easy to spot on an X-Dump because as you can see here, most of the data is pretty linear, so it, like, it looks like something on the X-Dump. So I turn everything into code, I look for those maps, I look for cross-references to those blob of data, and I'm like, okay, those, those uh, functions actually use those maps, so they must be legit. And then like, I start reversing from them, so there, struggle a lot, until I have something okay-ish, which is normal reverse engineering. This is a representation, for example, of the advanced map with Python. So you can see how it's a 3D map and it's how the whole engine is actually managed. Nice. I can get all of my data on my IVI. I'm very happy with that. But what else can I do? Because so far, it's a bit boring. So let me give you a brief piece of history about Japan. In 1988, there was what they called the Gentleman Agreement, which was an agreement between all manufacturers to limit new production car to 278 horsepower and 180 kilometers per hour. Uh, the 278 horsepower limit was just on paper because most cars, like my car, were actually sold as 278 horsepower cars, while they would at least make 300, 310. But the speed limit was actually pretty well enforced, and today, while this uh, horsepower limit has been lifted, the speed limit remains. So if you want to sell a car on the Japanese market, whether it's imported or JDM, it has to be computer limited to 180-ish kilometers per hour. Uh, some cars, like the Nissan GTR, the R35, have uh, an option that actually disengages this speed limiter if it's found that you're on a circuit. But for most cars, you are just like, you're stuck with it, you're stuck with it. So, and my car was no exception. How this speed limiter works is actually it just cuts all fuel injection. So you are, when you reach 180 kilometers per hour, most of the time you are just flooring the car. All the weight is transferred to the back, you are like on, like, against your seat, and 
fuel cutter rises, the whole car dives forward, the whole drive trains take a hit, you hear a big bang, it's like, it's very, very uncomfortable. And when I would take my car on the Fuji Speedway, which is one of the biggest, if not the biggest circuit in Japan, I would reach this limit before the first half of the like, longest straight of the circuit. So I had the second straight where I had to look at the speedo being like, I don't want to reach it, I don't want to reach it, and wasting a lot of time. So I wanted to get rid of that speed limiter. Uh, but I wanted to do it myself because it's more interesting. So I needed to understand how it works. And for that, the best way is just to look at the code. So as I was saying earlier, the RPM, for example, is stored on one byte because you have to divide it by 25. Uh, the speed here uh, is the same, but it's divided by two, so you have a two kilometers per hour precision. And you can see here that the speed limiter is actually activated when you reach 188 kilometers per hour. When you reach this speed, a bit is set on a bit vector and fuel injection is cut. It is reactivated though when you reach a speed which is under 186, which is 184. So between 184 and 188, you are in this kind of floating state where you are accelerating, decelerating, accelerating, decelerating, with the drivetrain taking a hit at each time. So it's very, very uncomfortable. Okay, how do I get rid of this? There, is, like, there are a few options for that. Uh, the most, like the easiest and most customizable solution is to go aftermarket. So you buy just another ECU, which is an aftermarket tuner ECU. This one, for example, is for my car, which is already $500. Uh, this is Yahoo Auction, which is basically the eBay in Japan. So if you buy uh, an ECU from this, you need a retune. You need to retune your car, which has a, a cost too, and, a pri and a, it's it can be quite long, and I'm basically losing all the work I've done so far. Dumping the ECU, reverse engineering, understanding everything, and all my IVI data. So I didn't want to do that at all. Pass. As I was talking about earlier, you have the DotaBot solution, which is, uh, so you have a British tuner, which is called ESL, Endering Solution Limited, that actually sells those kind of DotaBot here for $400. You just solder it on your main ECU, and you get uh, tuning, logging, and um, removing the speed limiter capabilities. But same, it's not cheap, and it needs a retune, so pass. The interesting part is that a lot of people actually import cars from Japan. And out of Japan, you don't always have this speed limitation. So, for example, a lot of American import cars from uh, Japan and go onto internet saying, hey, how do you remove this speed limiter? And there is an awful lot of answers that are just basically cut the VSS wire. The VSS is a vehicle speed sensor, which is a sensor on the transmission that sends to the ECU the speed you are actually driving at. So if you cut this wire, the ECU will think you are going zero kilometers per hour all the time, effectively disengaging, like never reaching that speed limiter. But what people don't know because they don't reverse engineer stuff is that there is a lot of side effect in doing this. In my example, like in this car example, and two other cars from this era, they are what they, we call transition maps. If you are cruising on the highway and if you are like flooring it on the circuit, you don't need the same kind of fuel injection, like you don't have the same need in engine management. So based on the speed, sometimes the ECU will decide whether to use one map or another. So if you cut the VSS uh, wire, of course you won't reach the speed limit, but at the same time you will never be able to use the full power maps, so you will effectively lose power, which is not what you want if you are looking to remove the speed limiter. And uh, in my example, uh, in my car example two, uh, after like 45 seconds of not having any speed uh, going to the ECU, the ECU will go into limp mode, fuel cut, no power anymore, check engine light on, because it knows when the transmission is in gear, it knows when I'm accelerating, so if it feels like something is fishy, the car will just go into limp mode and you effectively lose the engine too. So don't cut the VSS, doesn't work. But what you can do is actually fake the VSS. So HKS here, amongst other companies, sell what they call the speed limit defensor, which is not cheap neither, between 100 and 200 euros, and it basically takes this signal and modifies it on the run. So I don't want to pay that neither. So I was like, I'm going to do it myself. Here is how this VSS works. You basically have a gear on the transmission that turns next to a magnet. If the magnet is between two teeth, you will get a low signal, and if it's on a tooth, you will get a high signal. So the faster you're going, the faster this gear is spinning, and the higher the frequency of the signal. So what you can do is just read this signal with a TNC, for example. TNC are very nice. And 
just try to understand what speed corresponds to what frequency. If you see that you are going under 180 kilometers per hour, you just forward the signal as is. And if you are going above the speed, you forward the signal that is around 180. So that the car still knows you are going pretty fast, but you are not going too fast so that it doesn't trigger the speed limiter. So how do you do that? A TNC again. It's actually pretty simple. You just do a loop that um, toggles the signal from low to high with a certain, like at a certain frequency. So this delay five, five milliseconds, uh, gives the speed on my IVI that says about 140 kilometers per hour. If I put a delay four, which is what I use uh, in production, uh, it gives, sorry, a speed of around 174 kilometers per hour. Fun fact, when I first tried this, I was on my parking lot idling engine at, at like 900 RPM, and I run this loop without any delay. So the IVI started printing 354 kilometers per hour, um, speed limiter, fuel cut, and the engine was running so slowly that the whole, uh, like the whole car stalled. But at least it works. This is a Fuji International Speedway straight I was talking about earlier. As you can see, when I reach the middle now, I'm already far away, like the 180 kilometers per hour. So we kind of lose in precision after a certain speed, but with a GPS on this rainy day, I was able to reach 220 kilometers per hour. And on a dry day with my 22 years old car, I reached 242 kilometers per hour without any kind of problem. So I was pretty satisfied to ever, like, at least be able to do my real times on the circuit. Um, so the project itself is not, like, it's pretty stupid because you can just buy something and do, like, not waste three months doing it yourself. But what it shows is that most aftermarket tools are not witchcraft. The SLD was replicated with $15 a TNC and a level converter, and it works, like, for my own usage, of course, I'm not going to sell it, it works pretty well. Uh, ECUs are getting complicated because you have the CAN bus now, a few ECUs like for each kind of, like each part of the car, but the basics stay the same. So if you want to understand how a car works, start reversing stuff because it's like it's super nice. And last but not least, go simple but go safer. So stop cutting your VSS wires. It doesn't work and you're going to lose your engine. You want to reach the speed limit for sure, but you won't go anywhere, neither. Thank you very much for your attention and I think we have a little bit of time, yeah, for questions? if you have a question. Thank you very much.